Day 201 of the war in Gaza and the long-anticipated IDF operation in Rafah appears to be drawing close, with tent camps emerging for the mass evacuation of the city. The IDF is planning the readying the Rafah operation while also dealing with Hamas operatives returning to areas of Gaza previously controlled by the army. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Satellite imagery shows the expansion of refugee tent camps near Khan Yunus and Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip, where empty lands have been filled in ahead of the expected army offensive into the densely populated Rafah area that is refuge to some 1.3 million residents, many evacuated from homes earlier in the war. The IDF will reportedly begin the Rafa operation after giving civilians passage to evacuate to tent complexes outside of the battle zones during the next four to five weeks. The operation will move forward in stages after a division of Rafa into defined areas. The IDF will inform the local population before they advance into each area so that the local population can evacuate before the IDF moves forward. Prime Minister Netanyahu hinted at the coming operation in Rafah and elsewhere in Gaza aimed at eliminating remaining Hamas strongholds. Air and limited ground operations were carried out in several areas of Gaza that had been cleared of terrorists during earlier stages of the war. The IDF largely withdrew ground forces and Hamas returned in several locations. The IDF Arabic spokesman warned civilians to evacuate from fighting zones in the Strip's north as the army launches missions at Beit Lahia and Beit Hanun. Israeli airstrikes intensified with some of the heaviest shelling in weeks. Strikes by air and shelling from tanks on the ground were also carried out in central and southern areas of Gaza. The IDF was targeting Hamas rocket launching positions in southern Gaza. Dozens of airstrikes were carried out across Gaza over the past day. Targeted buildings used by the terror group, observation posts, rocket launching sites and other infrastructure and operatives. The renewed shelling and bombing of northern Gaza comes almost four months after the Israeli army announced it was drawing down its troops there, saying it had dismantled Hamas's military framework in the area. Troops in the Nahal Brigade launched a new pinpoint operation against Hamas in the central Gaza Strip corridor. The operation is ongoing during the Passover holiday. The army said the surprise operation was aimed at deepening achievements in the Netzarim corridor along the North-South Highway. Israel Bonds, the heartbeat of solidarity, the powerhouse of support. When the Hamas-Israel war hit, Israel Bonds stood tall, proving we're more than just an investment, we're a lifeline. Investing in Israel Bonds isn't just a financial move, it's a declaration for resilience, strength, and a better future for Israel. Join us and let solidarity echo through generations. The U.S. Senate has passed with an overwhelming majority a $95 billion aid package to support Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. The bill specifically allocates $26 billion to Israel in support of its right to self-defense in the fight against the Islamic Republic of Iran and its terror proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah. Let's take a closer look at what happened on Capitol Hill. On Tuesday, the U.S. Senate passed a long-awaited $95 billion aid package to support democratic allies of the United States, including Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. This national security bill is one of the most important measures Congress has passed in a very long time to protect America's security and the security of Western democracy. The Senate approved four bills package as one with a vote of 79 to 18, approved $61 billion to Ukraine, $26 billion to Israel, and $8.12 billion to Taiwan. It also includes a provision that would demand the sale of TikTok to a non-adversal nation, as well as targeted sanctions on the Islamic Republic officials. Of the $26 billion marked for Israel, $17 billion will go directly to wartime assistance, with another $9 billion going to humanitarian relief for the people of Gaza. When Iran-backed terrorists 
invaded the Jewish state on October 7th to slaughter innocent Israelis. I warned that the world would watch closely for signs that American leadership was actually weakening. Our enemies have tested whether the arsenal of democracy is, in fact, built to endure. Well, tonight, the Senate will send a clear message. The bill, which has bipartisan support in the House and Senate, is expected to be signed into law today by U.S. President Biden. The U.S. approves aid to Israel for the Gaza war and attacks from Israel's northern front continue. The IDF has remained steadfast in its intent to continue the job in Gaza, potentially launching an operation in Rafah. Here with us to discuss the impact of U.S. aid and the situation in Rafah is Brigadier General Reserves in the Reserves, Amir Avivi. Amir, thank you so much for joining us now. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, what... Uh what is the current situation in Rafa? I mean, we saw that there have been some strikes. Is there going to be a full-scale operation? Yes, there is going to be a full-scale operation in uh, Rafa. The forces are preparing. The cabinet approved the plans. Uh, the Israeli defense forces are preparing for the ground incursion. And, and it's not going to look like anything we saw before. This is the last stronghold of Hamas. Uh, this is the place where Hamas would be defeated. So I think there is going to be fierce fighting and it will have to be a very, very decisive uh, move. And uh, also at the same time, the IDF is deepening its control in the northern part of uh, Gaza. We saw uh, several shootings uh, from uh, Bet Lahia and Bet Hanun. And uh, this requires uh, further uh, pinpointed operations to find these terrorists who are still uh, moving around. Now, in the event of this operation, which you uh, have stated you do believe will happen, what impact will it have? You mentioned it will be the defeat of Hamas, but will this be enough to truly oust Hamas from power? And what about the larger threat, whether from Hezbollah or the Islamic Republic? So basically, the most basic condition to be able to achieve the goals of war, meaning destroying Hamas as a governmental and military entity, uh, reaching the hostages, and preventing the buildup of a terror army in Gaza. All this depends on Rafah. The leadership of Hamas is there. Most of the hostages were taken to Rafah, and uh, this uh, requires this operation. After Rafah, uh, the army will concentrate on the northern part of, uh, on the northern border, sorry, uh, with uh, Hezbollah. We'll see the army concentrating its forces in the north and preparing for a ground incursion with Hezbollah, uh, unless Hezbollah retreats according to Resolution 1701. Now, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. aid package. What impact will this $17 billion have on the war, if any? I mean, we're talking billions for Iron Dome replenishment, missile defense replenishment, but also the U.S. approved $3.5 billion for advanced weapon systems specifically. What does this actually mean, and what is its impact on the war? Well, this is going to have a huge impact because we have to sustain a very, very long war uh, in Gaza, in the north, prepare also for a possible war with Iran. So the continuous flow of weapons uh, is crucial for the ability of Israel uh, to sustain this uh, very long war, which might take more than a year. I mean, uh, it's uh, quite probable that the hardest part is still ahead of us. And this is uh, Hezbollah and Iran, not uh, Hamas. Absolutely. Now, what is the U.S. expecting in return for this aid package? And do you believe that Israel's prepared to comply with that following the events such as, you know, sanctions on a specific unit of the IDF and some of the hostile comments that have been made by the U.S. administration? Well, I think it's a terrible thing. Uh, I think that uh, basically uh, sanctioning a uh, Israeli battalion is saying to the state of Israel, we don't trust you, we don't trust your uh, judicial system, we don't trust the commanders in the army to be able to uh, carry out uh, the orders. And, and this is uh, bad. And I think uh, it's a huge mistake if it's going to happen. Um, I can say that uh, the unit, Haredi unit, is a very good unit, serious soldiers, 
they do the best they can. And if there is anything out of the ordinary, the army knows how to deal with this. And it doesn't necessarily apply just to this battalion, to any battalion. Well, let's hope that the United States is not providing this aid with strings attached, since, as we both know, it's in the interest of both countries to get rid of these terrorist organizations. I want to thank you so much for your time, Brigadier General Amir Avivi. Thank you very much. For six months, we've been hearing blood libels accusing Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians, a lie that's been repeated by anti-Israel protesters in the West, as well as by leaders like Erdogan in Turkey. Now, this is especially ironic because today, April 24th, is the Memorial Day for the Armenian Genocide committed by the predecessor to the state of Turkey, the Ottomans. The Ottomans actively have destroyed evidence of the systemic murder of between 1 to 1.5 million Armenian Christians who were brutally slaughtered. Armenians were robbed, tortured, raped, sent on death marches into the Syrian desert, and murdered by the Ottoman Turks in 1915. When other nations have recognized this horrific crime against humanity, Turkey has responded by threatening them. This genocide is widely seen as a precursor to the Holocaust, yet unlike Germany, which has taken responsibility, Turkey did the opposite. Turkey criminalized Armenian genocide recognition, and this thuggish bullying has even prevented Israel from formal recognition of the Armenian genocide, a historic wrong that must be righted, and what better time than now? This week, Erdogan hosted senior Hamas officials for a discussion on possible relocation from Qatar to Turkey. He's consistently sided with terror groups and has continued to incite against Israel. For him, of all people, to accuse Israel of genocide is hypocritical and insulting to actual victims of genocide like Armenians. Will the terror supporters protesting against Israel today, falsely accusing Israel of genocide, be silent about the Armenian genocide too? The self-righteous indignation and obsession with Israel while completely ignoring human rights atrocities being committed elsewhere highlights the moral rot that has taken root in our societies. Whether from Western protesters or from dictators like Erdogan, there is silence on the famine in Sudan where thousands are starving to death. Silence on the crimes against humanity being committed by China against Uyghur Muslims. Silence on Armenians being ethnically cleansed from Nagorno-Karabakh. And silence on the Islamic Republic brutally beating Iranians for hijab violations. What they really mean when they say that Israel is committing a genocide is that they want to commit a genocide against Israel. Something Hamas has been very clear about since day one. The hysteric demonization of the Jewish state is simply projection. Don't dishonor the victims of the Armenian genocide by falling for the libels of genocide denier Erdogan. On the northern front, the IDF successfully targeted two senior Hezbollah operatives in Lebanon, and air defense knocked out terrorist drones targeting Akko. ILTV Steve Leibowitz has the latest. Two top Hezbollah operatives were killed in separate Israeli airstrikes in southern Lebanon. A drone strike in Adlun near the coastal city of Tyre killed Hussein Azkul, who the IDF identified as a central figure in Hezbollah's air defense unit. The army described his death as a significant blow to Hezbollah's air defense. Another overnight strike in South Lebanon killed Mohammed Atiyah, who the IDF said was a member of the aerial unit of Hezbollah's elite, Redwan Force. Atiyah was involved in the preparation and execution of various terrorist attacks against Israel. Earlier, explosive-laden drones launched by the terror group were intercepted by air defense over Israel's northern coast. The IDF said three suspicious aerial targets believed to be explosive-laden drones were successfully intercepted by air defense over the sea, one off the coast of Naharia and two near Acre. The rocket siren sounded in Acre and it was activated due to fears of falling shrapnel. Following the drone attack, Israeli fighter jets struck two buildings in South Lebanon where the IDF said Hezbollah operatives had gathered. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. 
After more than six months, the families of the more than 130 hostages in Gaza are frustrated by the lack of progress in hostage negotiations, as is the United States. But it's not Israel to blame. Let's take a closer look at the story. For 200 days, Israeli hostages have been held in captivity by the terror organization Hamas after being kidnapped on October 7th. Despite multiple rounds of negotiations with the U.S. and Qatar as mediators, no deal has been made despite Israel's repeated generous offers. The families of Israeli hostages have expressed great frustration with the failure to bring home more hostages. Today is uh, the 200th day that we have uh, hostages kidnapped. People, babies, women, Old people, soldier, uh, was were kidnapped 200 days ago. And my brother-in-law is back there in Gaza. And with that, with 132 more people, it's too much. It needs to be end. In response to the failed talks, the U.S. has criticized Hamas for moving the goalposts on negotiations, even when Israel has come to the table with serious offers. What you have seen over the past few weeks is Hamas move the goalposts. Uh, there are demands that they have made. Israel has moved some way to meeting those demands, and Hamas has then changed their demands. And so it certainly does seem like Hamas is more interested in a full-scale regional war. Hostage negotiations have recently come under scrutiny as Qatar, a mediator, has been accused of bias given Hamas leaders actually live in Qatar itself. The attention has led to a possible discussion of Hamas leaders relocating from Qatar, but the government of Qatar has rebuffed these statements. <laughs> In addition to accusations of bias over their associations with Hamas, Qatar has also faced recent criticism for their coverage of the Gaza war on Al Jazeera. This week, a Qatari official also made headlines after receiving a standing ovation at the Arab League for stating that October 7th was a prelude and that Jews are murderers of prophets. Well, after weeks of protests against Israel and in some cases in support of Hamas, college campuses seem to be intensifying in their extremist conduct. Columbia University and NYU both have been major battlegrounds with multiple anti-Semitic attacks taking place in recent days. ILTV's Rachel Safti has more. Anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses has reached alarming heights, with anti-Israel protests morphing into mask demonstrations under the guise of the Palestinian cause. These protests have escalated to the creation of Freedom Zone encampments, as many protesters conceal their identities with masks or kafiyas. Banners singling out pro-Israel individuals as Al-Qassam's next targets, a blatant call to kill Jews. At Columbia University, police intervention led to the arrest of about 100 protesters. Yet their return raises doubts about the administration's ability to manage the situation. Columbia University President Shafiq faces congressional pressure to resign after misleading testimony about an anti-Semitic professor's presence on campus. The protests have become so aggressive that the rabbi of the university told Jewish students to stay home and remote learning was instituted. Meanwhile, also in Colombia, Jewish professor Shai Davidai had his university ID blocked and could not enter the university. Similar scenes unfolded over the weekend at Yale as Jewish students were harassed. Sahar Tartak, a Jewish Yale University student journalist, was stabbed in the eye with a Palestinian flag and was hospitalized. On Monday, Yale finally called in police to arrest those who refused to leave a campus plaza. These protests have spread, and the lack of action taken at Columbia has now led to many universities stating encampments and rallies of their own, as students at MIT, Emerson College, Tufts, and the New School set up encampments following in Columbia's footsteps. This rise in anti-Semitism exposed a connection to Qatari money being flooded into these universities. A 2022 report exposed that Qatar contributed $4.7 billion to dozens of academic institutions across the United States. These events paint a stark picture of the growing crisis of anti-Semitism on campuses. Now here in studio to discuss the crisis on campus is ILTV's Rachel Safti. Now, Rachel, I myself actually just returned from New York. I was at Columbia University, and the scenes that I saw of these protests, I mean, they're shocking, the anti-Semitism. 
Are, are Jews being singled out on campus again? I mean, I know in your report you included how Shai Davidai was prohibited from entering campus. What's going on? Well, yes, Emily, it's, it's shocking, but Professor Shai Davidai, he's a Jewish professor at Columbia Business School. He was blocked from entering Columbia University. Uh, he's someone that has been very outspoken since the beginning of this war uh, on the anti-Semitism that's, that's going on, on on campus. And the COO of Columbia University was there as he was blocked from entering and said that he can't guarantee his safety. And you know, that's that's absurd. That's what Jews were told in the Holocaust. That's what Jews were told in Arab countries when they were, they were being ethnically cleansed by police and by security officials. Leave because we cannot guarantee your safety. And we're seeing that in U.S. in American campuses, in Ivy League universities. When you have rabbis telling Jewish students not to go, now there's online classes, but only if you're Jewish. I mean, it's insanity what's happening. And I think one of the most you know, prominent narratives that we're seeing this week in the media is that these protests are peaceful. Now, I witnessed violence at these protests in addition to calls to violence. Why is this narrative picking up that, that these protests are peaceful when they're so clearly not? Well, it's a disguise, right? In the same way that it's it's an anti-Israel protest disguised as a pro-Palestinian protest, um, and we hear extremely anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric, and and we see that as well in action. So, uh, as I said, we saw this this Yale student being hospitalized after she was stabbed in the eye. Uh, you know, we're seeing people throwing punches. We saw over a hundred people being arrested uh, in in Yale, you know, in NYU, uh, and so you know, it's 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 ongoing, and because they. Were weren't able to control this in Colombia, now it's, it's spreading all over. That's right. We saw the BDS movement, I think, even calling on student groups to, to do this same sort of activism, which, by the way, is illegal. These are not sanctioned protests uh, across campuses. Um, thank you, Rachel, for your report. While Israel is busy on the war front, the weather is warming up and many Israelis are heading to the beaches. ILTV's Ariela Lahiani has the latest. Hi Emily, so I'm here at the beach in Tel Aviv and it is boiling today. We're expected to reach around 36 degrees Celsius, definitely the first heat wave of the summer and the beach is getting more and more busy by the minute. But though the summer energy is definitely here, it's for sure different to previous years. As you can't forget, we are still in the middle of a war. So I'm going to speak to a few people and see how they feel about what's going on. It's a, there's a normality, everyone's kind of adjusted to the new norm. But yeah, everyone in the back of their mind is thinking of the hostages and the war and, and all of our friends are going to Miloim and fighting for us. So our friends aren't around us and yeah, it's sad, but people are just getting on with it and um, we'll dance again. The, the famous saying is definitely happening and people are embracing that. The weather is beautiful. I just arrived two hours before. It's like uh, normally all the person are in the beach today. We don't think about the world, but in Israel, it's all the time like this. You need to be uh, aware to one day good, one day not good, but uh, the life. Everybody are very stressed about it, and we think about it like all the time. But um, yeah, and it's very, very hard, very hard time in Israel. Like people are afraid of the rockets and from Iran and Gaza, but we have a strong army and strong people, so we can be still like. Um, in a perfect mood and uh, we're motivated, so that's that's okay. Yeah, I agree with him, but it's kind of sucks that you can like go outside a lot and like go like travel and stuff. Yeah, I feel less nervous here than I do outside of Israel, so I feel more safe and comfortable here because I know that everyone has our back. Where Bukhul, outside of Israel, there's a lot of anti Semitism and you don't know who has your back and who doesn't. So. I, I feel safer here than I do when I'm overseas. And now let's take a look at that weather forecast. The weather is warming up around the country tonight with lows of around 23 degrees Celsius or 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, we'll have more high temperatures, seeing highs of about 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Emily Schrader, wishing you a happy Passover, and thank you so much for watching.